So today's topic is, thank you. Can showing viewer ads in your app lead to more money? Um, it sounds really generic, I think, um, but indeed it's a really broad question, so we'll try to cater this question by dividing it into two different aspects. So what are we going to learn today? For the first part, we're going to talk about why is ad frequency important, also what does that even mean? Second part, we'll more talk about how to use Data Warehouse to run some like um, optimized report that you can easily adjust your ad frequency and then share a ECPM benchmark report if you guys are interested. So a bit of self-marketing. Uh, tangent, what is Tangent? Um, I have been asked like probably 100 times what does tangent actually mean? So the word itself, does actually anyone know what does tangent mean, the word itself? All right, <laughs> probably no one. Um, it's actually a Japanese word for God of Wisdom. And as for why did they choose this word, you have to ask our CTO, he's somewhere in this building, uh, we need to find him. <laughs> but um, he'll give you a like, profoundly interesting answer. Um, so we provide tools and training for developers. Um, we're a relatively small team. So we try to cater to whatever things people are interested in and also learn with our customers. So for the top chart, seven out of 10 are actually our customers. It's something that makes us happy because only when our customers grow, we also grow. So we have some customers around the world, um, mostly in Europe. Um, here in the UK, we have Quali. Quality. <laughs> and then um, like now we are trying to also expand to more other region. And then the three top reasons of choosing us, uh, we have a really lovely customer success team like my colleagues here, Kana and Ebony. They're both amazing. They will have all kinds of schedule one-on-one -on -one with you to understand what's your pain point and how come our product can actually cater to your needs. And then for Prada, what like, we're specializing is actually we have a data warehouse product called Data Fold. Um, it's more like you just don't have to build your own data warehouse if you don't want to, and we have this data um, warehouse. But if you think like your data warehouse is better, you can also just ingest our data into your own data warehouse, no matter it's on Google Cloud, Redshift, or whatever. The third part is pricing, because it's free to try. Um, when you send us too many events, we'll start to charge you money. So here's our main customer success team. I personally also, I'm a data scientist, but I also work in this team with Carol. We mainly do like data stuff. <laughs> and um, we have people in San Francisco. Our uh, CEO, Chris, is based in San Fran. Um, and other colleagues in Japan, all spread out. Okay, here, jump to the main topic. So. Um, in order to cater what leads to the more money, we need to define what the money means. So we need to first discuss what are the types of ad revenue data out there currently. So the first part is like just a basic ad revenue data that your ad network sends you, also what they send us. So this is exactly the data you'll find on our dashboard. And then this um, is our user level data would be like we use session to calculate it. Um, in this data, you won't find impression le level. The second one is like now app loving and aerosols, they are like um, start releasing this user level data. Um, you can have the user level data and then sometimes some sort of impression level via calculation. The third part is something we're currently working with is a MOPA impression data. Um, you can actually access impression data in our data warehouse currently. And we have been seeing our customer doing really profoundly interesting things. And then after knowing all these three types, we can jump back to the topics, can actually show in fewer ads in your app make more money to you. Um, do you think it is true statement? Anyone? <laughs> yeah, okay, awesome. So the truth is we don't know, so we want to know. <laughs> um, so we realize the conventional way is always show more ads, get more money. But you always will reach a point that you're afraid whether you annoy your users too much. Um, so you start to think, is there a point where I can just stop annoying my users so much while still you know, get all the monies I want to get? 
So we'll split our workshop into the basic part, just talking about how to just use our tangent data exposure for free, and then also just uh, add network data to calculate the optimal frequency. The second part, we'll more talk about the methodology we have been seeing using our data warehouse to manipulate the impression level data. So for the basic part, we want to start a conversation, like what metrics do you actually first track when you launch a new game? CPM. Yes, perfect. That's a bit quick. <laughs> so the first thing you have to track is retention. Um, it's always a bit difficult for us for people ask us like, uh, if you know what's um, okay retention? Uh, it's really hard to tell customer like, okay, if your retention is like 5%, you really should think about something else like for day one. But um, you know, people treat everything like their baby. It's like if I have an app, I'll treat it as a baby. But you know, sometimes it's sad to realize the truth. If you only have day one 5% retention, it's better mm, to do something else. Um, the second one is like after you find out retention, you need to find out your cohort date ad revenue, which is called lifetime value LTV. So this is how our dashboard looks like. Um, you can add the metrics, put whatever you want. So you can also put ROI, rows, anything you want. Um, when you add to like maybe 100 columns, this dashboard would look really ugly. So just <laughs> don't do that. Um, but. The thing here, retention rate always um, has a direct correlation with impression per user. This is something we plot, we realize it's always true like when you annoy your users too much, your retention rate would drop. It's also like a normal thing, like no one wants to watch one million ads in 10 minutes. Um, but we are trying to figure out what's the optimum point for ad frequency, and then we realize actually we can plot a 3D plot. So imagine you actually have a Z axis, and it's a 3D plot. So you can plot your LTV value, and when it reaches the highest one, that's your cutoff point. And then in terms of how to use that um, chart, or like how to plot that, uh, we can discuss after the talk, uh, either any of your BI tool would work, either Tableau, Periscope, or anything. So in order to conduct this analysis, you need to pull some data, and this is how our data exposure looks like. It's really startup like it, but it works. Um, you can get the, any metrics you want. There's a metrics, and you can select anything you want. And after you get all your data, you can plot into our spreadsheet. Um, we'll share this spreadsheet later uh, with a link. It's for free. And then there will be one tab where you put the data, you download from our data exporter, and this sheet is like where you can do your test. So here we just want you to focus on the column intent to show X ad per user. And this is where you can adjust a number to conduct your test. And here is some tests we did with our customer. Here we changed the name of the app because obviously we cannot say who they are, but this is an app our founder produced called Fuck Say What. Personally, I don't think it's a good one, but <laughs> it works for testing purpose. Um, intent to show X at this column. This is something we play with. You can decide how many um, ads you want to show user. And on the left part, you'll see all the days are like two days apart. And the reason for that is like, um, we need to wait for day one um, retention, so you cannot do it every day, because then in that sense, you won't have day zero plus day one. And this chart is basically trying to say, in this test we find out with our customer, when they try to increase till 10 ads per user, um, there, um, you'll see the total LTV actually drops, the last column, it drops by like $3. But if we only measure on the column next to the, this column E, you'll see like uh, actually ad revenue per user is still increased by two cents. But this is a part where you need to, um, I try to have a rationale like um, when you show more ads, your retention drops. That's why the total user per 10 user um, drops. So it's either you want to go down on this more ads and then 
maximize all the ads to get this ad revenue per user metric goes up, or you can just focus on day one um, revenue and you see it actually drops. So it's personal taste, but we personally think like people should focus on the last column. But um, it's definitely open for discussion because there is no way. So here's a link for the spreadsheet. Um, I would say it's not beautiful, but for any question or any like technical uh, issue encountered with the data exporter, we are always here to help or send us an email, anything. So here the second part is a pro part. We're going to use impression level data. So we realize there are five kind of analysis people usually do, and usually you can get maybe each of them in uh, ad network, but you cannot get all five of them. And the beauty is like actually you need all five of them to actually make decision. So here's the first part. Um, the impression level data we have in our data warehouse, but not everyone has the time to, you know, to figure out how to write a query or like what does each column actually mean. So what we provide is like we just produce the queries for you so that, so that you can run analysis. Um, it's something always ongoing because there are always something, someone wants to do something different, but um, we're relatively flexible, so feel free to let us know. So the first part is like with the pro part, because you have the data warehouse, you can drive around the query to see how many ads you have been currently showing your users. This is only one line, not that interesting. The second part is like determining the next, like now everyone's doing rewarded video, should I also do that? With their warehouse, you can also directly plot the line. With these three things, you can start to plot the uh, format with the per as uh, user, uh, as for per user, <laughs> it's really difficult to say that sometimes. Um, and so in this chart, you'll see, oh, actually I show my banners are increasing. And the next thing you want to check is like, does that actually generate me more money? Or is it just a waste of time to increase the banners? And here you see, this is actually our real data, but it's only for one app. So maybe it's like also something we need to talk about. So you see actually interstitial performs much well. So that means like for each ad, like interstitial is have a better performance and banners is just like something slightly not that interesting. And the fourth part with our data warehouse is something I plot in Tableau. Um, you can see the um, ad revenue per DAO by country. So here you see, for example, in the United States, the dot is so tiny, but why is that? It's just simply because a daily active user, the denominator is quite big. So even if you have a lot of money, but you have too much of population, that dot will become small. So you'll see actually in Central America, those dots become bigger. It's something really interesting to observe and then decide like, which com uh, country or region you want to prioritize when you launch your campaign. Um, why is this graph stop on Taiwan? It's simply because I'm from Taiwan, so I was check my country first. <laughs> um, the, this one is also a really interesting one. It's like we also start to calculate the variance across the RFDAO. And why is that? Because um, actually one of our co-founders used to work in an investment bank, so he always thinks like Compan is actually like an investment. Not everyone wants to buy, I don't know, not everyone wants to buy Bitcoin. Some people just want to invest in iron. So in this sense, like we realize actually for US or Japan, their variants are quite big. But in this sense, it's like you can always hold down those wells while you actually have in bear a really high risk. While some countries, like uh, for example, South Africa or like some other country that we usually not that interesting in, they actually have a really low variance, meaning it's like you, if you invest in this country, uh, the variance is quite low, so you don't bear that much risk. So, because in general sense, you, you don't put yourself into a high fluctuation investment. Um, but as what you prefer, it's based on personal taste. Some people just love to buy Bitcoin, so it's personal taste. And the last part is like something thanks to our um, 
lovely colleagues to produce. We start to plot the ECP and DK curve for our customers who have impression level data. This chart only shows partner one and partner two, but in real life, everyone will have like 10 ad network channel and stuff. So in real life, this chart is really messy. But what is interesting is like in real life, we actually see um, usually when it's like impression number one, the first ad you show to the user, all the bits are relatively close. So in this sense, you see both partner one and partner two, they like bid around $26, but when the um, more ads are showing, you see partner two are kind of weak. But there will be also cases, for example, like after uh, impression number um, 100, actually partner one stops bidding. So it's something really interesting to see how your ad network actually is trading you. <laughs> and then whether you want to prioritize certain network. Um, all, this, all this analysis and everything, we don't charge anything, it's just simply if you have impression level data in your data warehouse, um, which we also help ingest, we'll do it because we also like to see what is actually happening in the industry. So the last part is a bonus. Uh, we haven't released an ECPM benchmark for last year. Um, we d intend to do it at the um, first quarter of this year, which means before March. And here's a ECPM across the countries from Aura data last year. Um, the general sense is like um, if now you invest in China, there are still quite seems to be a quite high um, ECPN growth. But if you look in the total sum of ad revenue, it was like, which country makes me the more money? Still USA is always there. They still make 10 times more than any other country. Um, so in general sense, it's like, Maybe because now China is growing, you don't still don't have that much of user in your company. So when you divide the lower denominator, your current user is not that much. You have a higher um, average of ECPM. But if you're talking into the total zone, USA is still growing and it's still really strong. And that's the sharing for now. Um, any question, you can always send me an email, or if you're afraid of email privacy, you can send me a signal text. <laughs> and um, that's it, any questions? Cool, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, questions, any, does anyone have There's a question around the back here. I'll, sure. uh, I'll bring a microphone to you. I like the exercise, so I do it. Thank you, Oscar. Um, the ECPM at the last, um, is it average across um, what networks? No, it's all, so it's like, for example, it's all user in China. So that's why we think, that's why it's a huge jump because now people just start to monetize in China. So the, if you look at a total user in China, at least in our own data warehouse, compared to the total users in US, US still have much more. So this is all, all just data that you collected there? Not like yes. So it doesn't differentiate a network, but if you want, we can always run the, the splitting a network because it's just simply pull one column. So. Um, I've got a second question that's yeah. um, down to level of impression. So you can actually split um, the ECPM across every impression served per yeah. ad. So the question here is more like, because usually a network wouldn't show this data to the user. Uh, we also don't know until now we have this data so we can start to plot the impression per number, like, oh, this is our first ad, and that's observe each network's performance. Um, yeah. Yeah, so um, in terms of mediation, yeah. um, if you pull data from iron source, the one day mediating the networks, can you cross compare them to pulling the data from directly from the network? Um, I think because now we ingest the data, the current impression level data is coming from the MOPA event callback. Um, it depends on whether they split this into marketplace or mediation, but usually they do split. But in this sense, we can talk about more details if they didn't split in certain network. Thanks. Yeah, no problem.
Thank you very much. I think it was interesting, particularly the piece that you had comparing rewarded interstitial and uh, banner. Um, I mean, I've, I've had a long history of being involved in rewarded. I'm wondering particularly if it's about the nature of the changing uh, kind of usage of those ads in, in the old ways of using rewarded ads. It was a design technique. It was yeah. something that players actively wanted and they chose in particular points of play. But in the hyper-casual scene, that's not really the case, that you, you don't really have the time to get people to step away from, I mean, it's my, my view. Yeah. Do you think that might be why you're seeing a lo much lower return from rewarded than you would say interstitial? This particular slide I was yeah. thinking. Um, so here is just for one episode, we don't want to make a general like statement, but it is interesting to see because now everyone's like rewarded video times 10. <laughs> it's like, so it's just want to portray like it's not for every app, but in general sense, indeed rewarding video performs really well, but it's just not for every app. It depends on you have an ad like us, like Fox Say What, which is not a really interesting game, then <laughs> like um, maybe the mix should be adjusted. Yeah, well, I think it's, in, but it is interesting. I, I think it would be good to get this kind of, I mean, are, are there people in the room who've had uh, experience trying to use rewarded inside um, hyper-casual type or social type games? Has anyone tried that? Uh, so what, would you mind if I asked you, you know, what your experience was that? Is it, is it something which is useful or do you see a much lower take up than you might see in another game format? I'll, I'll bring the mic to you. Yeah, uh, so for us it was um, completely as you described, uh, not necessarily as uh, beneficial as we were expecting. So we are now looking at uh, interstitials. So, so my, my theory is that there's a, um, there's a difference of, of behavior. Uh, and I have a particular kind of view, uh, and I'd love to know what you think about this, um, that what we're talking about with a hyper-casual style end of gameplay is very much the fidget spinner mindset. It's the it's the immediate satisfaction. You know, do it now, die, do it now, die, do it now, die, do it now, do. It. And I think anything that takes you away from that flow is potentially a problem. But the interstitial has this for me a, a magical quality, where actually if I'm doing constant repetition like that, I actually need to stop. And the interstitial gives me time to pause, that I don't have to choose. It happens to me, I put the phone down, I go away, come back, pick it up again, or whatever it might be. Yeah. Is that, does that fit with your experience? Yeah, I mean, personally, I, I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't want to say something like I'm sure I'm not of, but what we see interesting is like, for example, like this plot, we plot it with rewarded video, but if you plot it in interstitial, you'll see it performs really differently. So each net, ad network, um, each ad format, um, with this whole decay curve will look totally different and you can prioritize your resource in the network we prefer with the right mix of format. That's what I think, but yeah. It's like no, no, <laughs> I think it's always the case though. I mean, uh, I mean, I'd be interested again if there's other people in the audience who have a similar experience because my feeling is that you know, getting the right balance, the, the ability to click out, you know, to, to cat kill uh, an interstitial I mean, I'd love to know if you've, have you ever seen any data that shows playable ads versus uh, just pure video in hyper-casual as opposed to normal use? Um, personally, I haven't. No. <laughs> yeah. Has anyone in the room seen that? I mean, you know, seen a difference in terms of behavior with, say, an interstitial that is pure video versus an interstitial which was playable? I don't know how you would measure that. Well, I think you're right. It, 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 sorry, it is difficult to measure, but I think I would measure it through... Um, looking at my sources, and I'd probably cohort it based on sources that are providing pure playable versus sources that are providing pure video. I mean, does that make sense? So I guess the first thing would be how do you measure the exit point on the ad network, right? Yes. So I want to skip, I want to skip truly, but if the X button is not there, you can't measure that. No, that's exactly a fair point. And maybe this is the thing that as a as an industry, we, 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 you know, are we getting the level of data that maybe we should yeah. for that? Um, so I think, I think we've got another 20, yeah. sorry, 15 minutes or so. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I guess like don't have much more context, but uh, for any impression level data, um, feel free to discuss with us because it's still an ongoing thing and then 
uh, impression level data is a lot of data to ingest and then finally thanks to our engineers like we manage the ingestion part but now it's a time to discover also with users like how to make the most because we collect all this data we need to get something out of it otherwise there is no point so yeah. I, mean, I think this is the other question of which uh, Eric Soffert did a fantastic article in November talking about how he felt like the hyper casual uh, game was dead and one of his arguments was that um, the value of a hyper casual user compared to a casual user is problematic. One particular example he used was programmatic. Yeah. So when programmatic is looking at the value of a, of a player, they're incorporating in that value the IAP purchases of that, of that particular player. Uh, obviously, to the extent that you can track that. Um, but the issue then means I'm, I'm terribly paraphrasing a very good writer, so apologies for that. But the issue for me then means that uh, are we seeing hypercasual becoming less and less valuable as a, as a game for monetization? And is that therefore making it harder and harder for us to find new content and, and maintain revenues? Yeah. I mean, sense? yeah, I mean, personally, I haven't observed like hyper casual is like dropping heavily against compared to casual, but with the plot, you can also like. You can also plot two apps um, next to each other and then see oh, whether certain and then work performs differently and also how your app, if you actually have one hyper cache and cache, you can totally do so. No, so exactly. I think like, what you've done here, particularly with this like, ability to look at the decay curves, yeah. I think is an exercise that you know, is incredibly powerful and whether it applies to comparing different apps or monetization providers, I think you know, absolutely agree this is a really you know, phenomenal way to do it. Is everyone doing that kind of, uh, of analysis? Are you doing comparisons with your game and other games and comparing formats? Is anyone doing that kind of analysis? I take it not then. <laughs> but I, I mean, this is maybe the thing is that we're always trying to find ways to innovate. We're always trying to find ways to adapt. Um, so anyway, on, on that note, um, has anyone else got any final questions? Oh, good job. Hello. Um, I have a question about the user re revenue level data. Um, you said on the slide that it's only 70 to 80 percent accurate. Um, yeah. Is that just because it's a new thing and it's only going to get better, or are there any hard, thing, hard things blocking it, um, yeah. potentially getting near 100%? So the thing is, like, actually, uh, the impression level data is ingested through event callback. Uh, so each impression level data will come with this dollar sign something, maybe it's like 80 cents. But if compared to the first thing, the first thing every hour we call an ad network API and then they will send us, oh, this is how much money you made for this campaign and in this country. But this thing always comes first, right? Because this thing we call the API at each hour. So we receive the data from the ad network for the per that hour for that day and company, country, or how much money you made. And later we process the impression level, um, dollar sign, 80 cent. And when you sum up, it never matches. It's a, an ongoing issue like we're trying to figure out, but we're just trying to portray the fact that it never matches. No is it matter. due to just one, like a few specific networks who are bad with data, or is it across the board, everyone? It's across, because yeah. like, you have this general number, and then it's depending on, for example, in this case, like Mopub, they have some mechanism to do this calculation, send you all this impression, for example, so Apple need watch something yesterday at 10 p.m., this word 80 cents. But for some reason, all the impression adds up. It doesn't match the directly hourly data we got. But um, it's a point where we want to portray also, like, this data impression at revenue might be important for you to prioritize, for example, ad frequency, but for general sense of how much you make, this is what matches your invoice. Like, yeah. Cool, thank you. No problem. Thank you very much. As you were flipping back, I saw a, a, an interesting one I was going to ask a question about earlier. The, the curve um, of, um, you know, uh, uh, opting, you know, the number of ads, you know, a bit further back, uh, this way, this way, the, um, you know, you've got the kind of linear curve that shows the frequency of ads. Yeah per user, ultimate ad frequency, that's it. So I'm, I'm really interested by this one. Yeah. And um, again, I'm gonna come back to re Rewarded to a certain extent. Because yeah. my, my impression, or at least my memory of Rewarded is that that kind of is, it works in a different way. And actually, um, often if you, in a casual game, 
if you don't have enough rewarded ads, you get complained at. Uh, is that still the? I don't know if it's still the case, but that was always the case up to a few years ago. Um, so, with this optimum ad frequency uh, curve that you're drawing here, do you know if it's just a general principle that you're applying and showing here, or have you seen any data that shows that different types of ads have different levels of optimum frequency? Um, for now, for all like, for example, banner, real world, we observe the same trend, but. It also depends on your own mix. I personally think it's more like generic because it's what we observe. Um, so we also highly recommend it to, actually we can also plot this for you, like uh, just plug a three dimensional graph and you'll see uh, whenever your LTV is the highest, you cut off. But just like here, we are not sure whether it's easy to impress today, so we just decide to do this. <laughs> Yeah. But I mean, I think this is a, a vital point. The number of times I've tr I've had clients and I've said, cut down on the ads, and they didn't. They just chucked more in, and the game died. Well, what a surprise! Yeah. Um, and and getting people to actually pay attention to their frequency. And I think not just in terms of the um, kind of retention rate in this sort of immediate, but also the long-term retention rate. Yeah. Uh, my, my impression is that if we don't pay attention to both the short-term and long-term retention rates, we end up in big trouble. And that's hard to do in hypercasual because our long-term retention rate is probably like seven to 14 days. 14 days is like probably the dream. Uh, I mean, it depends on the game, obviously. But a lot of games are very, very much short-lived. So I think knowing what you're looking at and applying a common sense to this kind of mindset, I think is going to be really powerful. Yeah. Cool. Uh, any last questions? On that note, I'm going to say thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you everyone for listening. <laughs>